So first off, if you could just tell um, us a little bit what it feels like to be preparing to return to California. Well, it's very exciting to be preparing to come back to California um, and especially to come back to campus because the campus has grown. It's changed so much since I was there as a student. A lot of new buildings and a lot of new facilities. So I'm really excited and it's also giving me a chance to kind of get rid of some things that I don't need to bring with me. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really eager and I'm looking forward to it. That's great. So you were here for four years, six years? I was there for six years. For six years. What are some of your, your best memories of campus? Oh, some of my best memories. Um, my favorite one is picnic day. Um, I always enjoyed uh, participating in picnic day. And but I think the other thing that the fond memories were of riding my bicycle to work or to the to the lab and onto campus every day. Um, and that was really um, exciting as well. And then I think uh, the other thing that I always remember was that during the summer you could get lots of really good fruits and vegetables. Um, there were just and nuts were everywhere, walnuts especially. So I'm looking forward to having fresh fruits and vegetables um, and those walnuts that were just falling off the trees. Um, so I'm looking to that. And then also um, I have a really fond memory of graduation day. So. <laughs> There'll be a lot of, uh, of things that come back, uh, and um, so I'm really looking forward to returning. Great. Oh, that sounds terrific. Um, as you get settled into UC Davis towards the back of January, what will be some of the things on the top of your to-do list? Yeah. On the top of my list, um, I think the first thing I'd really like to do is get to know and meet with the faculty, the staff, and the students in the departments that make up CAES. And so I'm really, I really, I think that that's going to be absolutely top on the list is to try to uh, meet with the faculty, come to their department meetings, um, meet with some student representatives. I got a chance to meet with uh, some of the student ambassadors when I uh, interviewed. And so I'd like to get back into some conversations with them and also with the staff. So I think, you know, that's really top of my to-do list. And then also um, as a College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, there are a lot of stakeholder groups that interact with various members of the college. And so I'd really like to get a chance to meet some people and uh, get to know some of the leaders in the agriculture and environmental in industries. What issues are common to New York agriculture and California agriculture? Yeah, I thought about uh, what are some of the things that are in common. And um, I think one of those is that all of the farmers on, in New York and in California are trying to find ways to produce their crops sustainably. And um, you hear that conversation across the United States, but it's really true in both of those uh, two states. And in New York, um, I would say that uh, for us, some of the issues around water are very different though from California. At times we have too much, California has too little. Um, and yet water as a conversation piece is very important to both states. And so um, I think that that's going to be something that um, is very, very common to both. And I think also what I see is a real passion from these farmers who um, want to farm sustainably and are looking to make sure that they can leave that farm to the next generation. That is a really important topic, I think, in both states. Uh, and so Again, I, I'm going to have some similarities and yet some differences, but I'm really looking forward to meeting those leaders in the agriculture industry. We've heard that you are passionate about the work of cooperative extension, and I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the unique role that cooperative extension plays in modern America. Yeah, so I have served as director for cooperative extension now for about 11 years, and um, I think you know the thing that's that's the the, the role that I see for um, modern day cooperative extension is really one of of helping the industries with some of the new information that's coming, and so oftentimes you hear people say, well, there's lots of information on the internet, there's information overload, and so where cooperative extension comes in is being able to provide the research based, the evidence based information, the stuff that's been proven and tested, and, and being able to provide that to stakeholder groups. But even more so, being able to 
provide information to help inform everyone so that they can make the decisions. It's not our decision to make. And so what I mean by that is, especially in New York, we've had lots of discussions around fracking and drilling for gas. And what we've been able to do is provide information around what we know is true so far. And then also to say where we don't have the information and then let the leaders in those communities decide what what their approach will be. And I think for moving forward, cooperative extension is going to be so important to be able to be out there as that unbiased source of information so that everyone can know the facts and be able to act accordingly on whatever issues are at hand. Thank you. Um, what are the environmental challenges that you see facing both California and the global community? I think one of the big challenges is going to be around climate change. Um, and all of us are looking at very big changes uh, in our environment. And can we adapt to those changes? And I know that in the college here, as well as at Cornell, there are researchers looking at uh, how to uh, breed for better crops that can handle drought tolerance. Uh, in our case, it could be drought tolerance, but also being able to handle deluges of water. Uh, one of the things in New York State that we have is, is we'll tend to have a dry summer, but when we get a rainstorm, it's a big, vicious rainstorm. And so can the crop survive that one day of being almost underwater because the net rest of the week will be dry? And so um, I think that there are similarities there in that in, uh, in California and especially in our college, we have faculty that are looking at significant uh, plant um, uh, drought tolerance uh, and, and are we breeding for those, the, the things that we need for the future. But I think also we need to look at the footprint that we as humans have in the environment. And I know that there are several faculty involved at looking at sustainable environments and how do we as humans impact the environment. So I think there's there's quite a bit um, of challenges that we'll be faced with. We have a coast, we have inland, we have mountains, we, we have it all in California. So it's going to be quite an interesting uh, as portfolio of environmental work that our faculty will be working on. Thank you. And experts tell us that um, the world needs to be preparing to feed a global population of more than 9 billion people by the year uh, 2050. What gives you hope that institutions like UC Davis, like Cornell, can help meet that challenge? I think uh, I have a lot of hope that our, our, our colleges, our land-grant universities can rise to that occasion. Um, when I think about the work that's being done at Cornell and at UC Davis, we have scientists that are really looking hard at how to increase production, uh, but also how to increase production in places that don't have the perfect water, uh, the perfect soils, the perfect nutrients, the perfect environment to grow the crop. And so I know drought tolerance is a huge one for both of our states to be working on for Cornell and for UC Davis, because we know that there are going to be parts of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, where it's going to be extremely dry. And can we grow crops in those environments? And so our faculty are working really hard, I think, on looking at increasing production to be able to feed the 9 billion people increasing production to do it sustainably so that we don't deplete the resources that we have. And then looking at um, plants themselves and how do we grow better crops that can be more drought tolerant, that can take the heat, and that can take inclement weather uh, patterns. We also have people that are breeding for resistance against insects and diseases. And when I think about the work that's being done on wheat, uh, that's looking at trying to produce new wheat varieties that can handle that new um, strain of wheat rust that could literally wipe out the globe's wheat crops. Um, those are really important projects. And so I know our faculty are going to have a huge impact um, to be able to feed the 9 billion people. We also have people in both states, uh, New York and California, working on rice. And rice is a huge staple in many, many parts of the world. So I know that um, we are poised to make a huge difference and to be able to provide the nutrition, the protein that we're going to need to feed 9 billion people. 